and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Nazia Iqbal. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. has reached a crucial milestone in its fight against COVID-19. This will not only help us come out of the pandemic faster, but will also give our economy a boost. Let's find out how. India reached the crucial milestone of administering 1 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses yesterday. While this will go a long way in protecting the lives of Indians, it will also play a crucial role in safeguarding their livelihoods. Shutdowns across the country and two devastating waves have left many sectors of the economy ravaged. In fact, some of the scarring might take years to heal. In the immediate term, getting as many shots as possible into as many arms is the surest way of getting the economy back on track which is why the 1 billion doses are a cause for cheer. A very encouraging development in India is the pace of uh, vaccinations. Now, it does appear that we are approaching the 1 billion mark, which is very, very significant for us, because the more people are vaccinated, the greater is the possibility of opening up the economy. And this is exactly what we are seeing in the country today. Several uh, services, for example, have made it mandatory for people to be vaccinated, both for operating uh, the service as well as for making use of the service. And I think as this number keeps uh, increasing, it's uh, possible that uh, there will be a greater pace of economic activity in these uh, segments which were uh, closed for a very long period of time. And to that extent, I think this is going to be very beneficial for India's GDP growth. So uh, when we did build in our uh, forecast of around 9% growth in GDP, it was predicated on the fact that things will be opening up in the second half of the year. And there could be uh, an upward bias now to this projection in case things do proceed at a rapid pace and uh, it becomes more possible for these services to operate at a more efficient level. We should remember that India is a services-oriented economy with around 60% of uh, GDP coming from this particular segment. Consider also that as more and more Indians have been vaccinated, even contact-intensive services like hotels and airlines, which were among the worst hit sectors amid the pandemic, have shown signs of life. Hospitality firms had a better than expected Dashera weekend and are now hoping to end the year on a positive note by doing brisk business during Christmas and the New Year. Leisure locations, in particular, saw the revenue they clocked surpassing the 2019 levels during the Dashera weekend. However, the industry will reportedly need another 6 to 12 months for the annual recovery to reach 2019 levels. It will give a lot of confidence level to uh, people who uh, intend to travel. Uh, although double vaccinations have helped us move things quickly, but uh, the confidence level, the, at the speed uh, is in which uh, vaccinations are dealt with are uh, tremendous and um, would help boosting uh, internal as well as external travel both. Uh, let me tell you, it's the confidence level which has to go up before people start traveling. And you can't have a better uh, possibility than actually telling yourself, uh, telling the world that how serious uh, this is and how people have accepted this and how the government is moving quick on uh, vaccinations. So uh, that will directly, indirectly uh, move, move everything. Now, in, in terms of definite numbers, I think uh, it will vary from uh, city to city, location to location. And uh, as far as international travel is concerned, that's the only one which is... Uh, a concern, a big concern even now. So we have to see when international flights, normal international flights 
start uh, operating, what is the you know outcome? And uh, but the message to them as well is, hey, India uh, is uh, vaccinating at a very fast pace. It's a safe place to go. But I think uh, you know only time will tell how much. But domestic is moving very, very quickly. Now, let's come to the aviation sector. On October 17, domestic airlines flew 327,923 passengers. This was the highest number of passengers since the resumption of air travel last May. In fact, this was about 77% of the pre-COVID traffic. Moreover, rapid vaccination and easing of restrictions have been fueling month-on-month -month traffic growth. And now, led by higher demand, airfares on certain routes are 30 to 45% higher during Diwali on a year-on-year -year basis. Delighted to see that as a result of this vaccination drive, some states are now dropping their requirement for passengers to have RT-PCR tests before arriving, provided they are fully vaccinated. This will lead to an increase in travel and the recovery of the tourism and the aviation businesses in India, which we can all look forward to. Clearly, the economy is gaining momentum. However, there are a number of challenges that still need to be faced. For one, depending on how things play out in the months ahead, there might be a need for booster shots, especially for vulnerable sections of the population and frontline workers. Secondly, the top two popular states of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar are lagging behind in delivering doses to their residents. And third, but most importantly, the pace of vaccination is slowing down. Social commerce platform Misho has already established itself as an alternative to e-commerce platforms in India's smaller towns. It recently raised $570 million in funding at a valuation of $4.9 billion. Now, what is its next stage plan? How does it plan to disrupt the grocery market? Will it have to go for another round of fundraising anytime soon? Misho CEO Vidit Atre answered these and many other questions in this exclusive interview with Business Standards Surajit Das Gupta. Thanks for joining the morning show. Misho has uh, become uh, really the uh, alternative for uh, the Flipkarts and the Amazons of the world, especially in the uh, smaller towns and cities, Taiwan, uh, two cities. What is your uh, second stage of your plan? I think, Suraji, the most important guiding, I would say, North Star for us is our mission. And that mission is to democratize internet commerce for everyone. And in this case, everyone includes consumers, small businesses, entrepreneurs in the entire country. And if you like, look from that perspective, the number of people we have in the platform is still very, very small. So one of the big focus areas for us for the next 12 to 18 months is to kind of go deeper and deeper into the country. So if I look at these small businesses who have never gone online and sold products, they look for very, very simple tools that will help them decide how do you price a product? How do you decide what kind of inventory you should build? How do you even decide what to manufacture, right? Like what is trending in the market and what is not? What is the kind of customer base you have and what are you looking at? And as you say, you will get deeper. Like today in terms of pin codes, uh, where have you reached and where do you want to reach? I think we serve like some 97, 98 percentage of, pin, of all pin code. But when I talk about penetration as the problem, it's more about if you're in a very remote corner of a country, do you have the selection that you buy? on our platform have we made it so local second when you come to the platform do we speak the same language that you do so that you find the platform very familiar so do we have as much localization as you want on the platform 50 percent of all transactors on our platform are new to e-commerce they have never transacted ever in their lives these are people who only use whatsapp as a product now for them to come to a platform figure out what does add to cart mean what does buy mean what does payment by XYZ process I mean they've never done this before. So it's quite overwhelming. So how do you build a very, very simple experience for them 
to come to a platform and make this happen. So this becomes a lot more important in penetration rather than delivery service because a lot more people before us have built out these infrastructure. A lot of these third-party logistics companies are there. Now in terms of how many sellers and how many customers we have on the platform. So today, I think our number of sellers who are selling on the platform is already more than 3 lakh. So more than 300,000 sellers are registered with us selling products on our platform. If I look at consumer side, an, a stat that I had shared recently on Twitter was 5% of all Indian households in India today come to Misho app every single day. And the goal we have set for ourselves is by December 2022, we want to have 100 million people in India transacting with us on a monthly basis. As of last month, that number was about 15 million. If you uh, look at groceries, it is obviously uh, slightly different from selling fashion where you've got housewives in and resellers of a different kind. Here, obviously, they are big players who are also doing exactly what you are doing. Plus, uh, there is a large investment one has to do because you have to deal with the uh, local shopkeeper, the Tirana stores. And that process is already started by the all the big companies. They have the whole focus is to go and go to those 20, 20 25, 30 million uh, people. So how do you take them on? Every single one of them have so far just focused on the top four, six, eight, ten cities. You would see that grocery because it's a tougher business. Everyone just been trying after the larger markets. No one so far has solved the online grocery model for the beyond tier one city because the margin profile in this category is so small that as soon as you go into tier two, tier three, the same business model doesn't work. Right, You just don't have enough economics to serve that customer in the same way you serve in day one. So that's why we started, we are not serving any customer in day one because our core customer for our core product also is mostly beyond day one. So we started with these small towns in Karnataka and that's what our playbook will be. So I would say we are disrupting of how online grocery is going to look like in smaller town cities and that business model is fundamentally different from what you see in day one. And there we don't see a lot of people, like no one has figured that model out yet. You uh, generally avoid branded products in your in your range. So do you create uh, localized brands? I mean, is that an area which you are looking at? So by the way, already because of the platform, we have seen so many of our small businesses across categories, across beauty, across this, where we see they have been able to create their brands because of platforms. So they're able to kind of create demand and they've been growing their brand on the platform. So brands that were never known have become known brands with these consumers. I mean, last time when I talked to you, you said that you uh, are not focusing on the monetization part at this moment, but obviously, uh, I mean, that is the key for all investors. Yeah, so another big development that we've had for our business for the last 12 months is we have scaled up the ad revenue on the platform quite significantly. I think already our ad revenue is late double digit percentage million dollars. Very high ad revenues coming onto the platform because the platform gets larger and larger. More and more seller wants to kind of promote their products onto the platform. So I think our big focus on monetization will continue to be around ads. And we believe that's a much more small business friendly way of monetization rather than charging very high percentage commission that has happened before us in the ecosystem. So ads will continue to be central to our monetization strategy on the platform. And over time, we want to do more things for our sellers. We want to build an ecosystem around them so they can get access to more services. Do you have a sort of projection of when do you sort of break even and how long does this money that you have, I mean, when do you have to go for another fresh round of uh, funding? Yeah, I think the beautiful thing about our business has been that we have always been a unit economics positive business. So we, on every single order that we serve on a platform, we make money. And I think that's been one of the things that our investors have also liked quite a lot since we started the business. To be a frank, company level profitability also is an option that we can explore whenever we want because the economics are so good that we can choose for that. But for now, because the market that we play in is so large, our focus, at least for the next few years, is going to be purely on growth. How do we go out and capture more and more of the market share? And at the right time, we will think about company level profitability. So uh, do you see this uh, money raise that you have raised will keep you okay for the next uh, one? Many one years. Hour? We raised the last round like six months ago. We haven't even touched that money. And okay. we're like using money like that we raised like many years ago. And mm -hmm. this is like quite significant, the one we have raised right now. So if you ask me, we don't need money for many years. And even in this round, by the way, it was a the last few rounds we've had as a company, a pure inbound. We never needed that money, but because... 
a great investor who can be a great long term partner for the company came in with the offer we said let's explore it so you will be you're already sitting on 700 800 million yeah yeah much more than that one last question i mean a lot of people think that uh, companies like you build it up but then eventually uh, the bigger boy comes in and you ultimately sell it to them and make a lot of money and go home happy i think by the way a lot of this is driven by what is right for the company at the right stage if you look at 3 4 years ago if you were a company that required lots of capital for many years and there are no investors or capital available you will have to sell it to someone so that you can keep running that company and keep scaling that i don't think any of the entrepreneurs you have seen in the market wanted to sell the company when it was sold but sometimes that's the last option left like you believe that hey the business that you're building still requires billions of dollars of investment and i can't find those investors i believe fundamentally markets have become much more deep now right like there's a lot more capital available yeah. there like 10x more investors so i feel the situation like that should not arrive as much but things change again right like and then you figure out what's the right thing for the company when yeah. it's the last yeah. option people do it so we will do what's the right thing for the company fortunately we live in a time where capital is now more amply available and we should not land in, into some scenario like that okay thanks a lot thank you uh-huh. very much Thank you. Thank you, Surajit. Nice talking to you. Talk to you. All eyes will be on Reliance Industries today as the company is scheduled to announce its September quarter numbers. Will it spring a surprise? Let's see what leading brokerages expect. The last trading day of this week is unlikely to be much different from earlier days in the week with most analysts expecting the frontline indices to remain range bound amid volatility. That said, the focus today will be on Mukesh Ambani controlled Reliance Industry Limited which is scheduled to announce its results for the September quarter Q2 FY22 later in the day. Analysts expect the September quarter performance of the oil to telecom conglomerate to be led by growth in retail, digital telecom on business and steady petrochemical margins rising oil prices recovery in retail business and improvement in refining and marketing margin are likely to aid the overall performance analysts at jm financial said in a result preview note we expect rils q2 fy 2022 EBITDA to grow 10% quarter on quarter to rupees 25600 crore due to an improvement in refining margin strong subscriber addition and recovery in retail business As regards the stock Nomira recently sounded cautious and downgraded the counter to a neutral from buy citing rich valuations Some other companies scheduled to declare their September quarter numbers today are Tata Consumer, Yes Bank, PVR, Inox Leisure, Glad Pharma and Hindustan Zinc. From a macro perspective, analysts are now cautious on the markets given the sharp run up seen in the past few months and advise investors to use a rally to book profit. The latest Bank of America survey of fund managers found that investors were increasingly worried about global growth expectations. The biggest risks to the equity markets, the Bank of America survey findings suggested were inflation, developments in China, and COVID-19. Geojit Financial Chief Investment Strategist VK Vijay Kumar said There are mixed cues for the market with some global tailwinds and domestic headwinds. Retail investors should temper their expectations. Partial profit booking, particularly in overvalued segments, may be considered. You often hear about open source and proprietary software and indeed the concept of open source itself. What are these? How did the idea originate? and how is open source driving modern day inventions we answer all these questions in this explainer if you are into tech you would have heard of open source software but before we get into it let's first understand what is open source open source is based on the principle that everything related to a project its framework models and data must be in the public domain this would help various participants not just learn about the workings but also help in advancement of the project through crowdsourcing 
In the realm of software, open source typically denotes that the source code of the said software is public. What this means is that any entity can review and in some cases edit the source code. In legalese, it is computer software that is released under a license in which the copyright holder grants users the right to use, study, change and distribute the software and its source code to anyone and for any purpose. You might ask, why would someone open up a software, something that one has worked hard to create, to everyone for free? Well, consider scientific research. Scientists do not keep their research and findings secret. Instead, they put it out in the open through papers so that other researchers can build on it and add to a collective understanding. Open source is at the heart of tons of modern day inventions. Online maps, Google's mobile operating system Android, WordPress, and even the internet itself. Every time users view web pages, check email, chat with friends, stream music online, or play multiplayer video games, their computers and phones connect to a global network of computers using open source software to route and transmit data. Google's Android, which allows infinite customizations to its platform, is open source. And this open source nature is said to have allowed its rapid development. A bit of history here. Open source philosophy originated in the US in 1970s. Early on, developers shared their code with other developers to learn and evolve the field of computing. Early examples include Donald Nutt collaboratively designing the TEX typesetting system in 1979 and Richard Stallman launching a GNU operating system for free in 1983. In 1998, Netscape Communicator, one of the first internet browsers, was launched for free and its source code became the basis of Mozilla Firefox and many other modern day browsers. That's all we have for you today. We will be back with more news and analysis in our next episode. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.